The Marian Empire, ruled by the Marian Dynasty, was a geographically extensive and powerful political and military empire in ancient India, originating from the indo gangetic plains of modern Bihar, eastern Uttar Pradesh, and Bengal. The empire's capital city, at Paliputra, near modern Patna, is where Chandragupta Maurya founded the dynasty in 322 BC after overthrowing the Nanda dynasty. At its zenith, the empire stretched to the northern natural boundaries of the Himalayan mountains and to the east into Assam. To the west, it reached beyond modern-day Pakistan and into significant portions of Afghanistan. It likely had a population estimated to be between 50 to 100 million people, almost a third of the world's global population at the time. The Marian Empire was the largest native Indian empire to rule the Indian subcontinent. And the Marian Empire's rule stands as one of the most significant periods in Indian history. After the Kalinga War, the empire experienced a half century of peace and security under the legendary Emperor Ashoka. The Marian Empire was a prosperous and stable empire of great economic and military power. Its political and trade influence extending across Western and Central Asia all the way into Europe. Hello and welcome to Unknown History. In this documentary, we will cover the history of the Great Marian Empire, starting with its meteoric rise and ending with its ultimate downfall. The story of the Marian Empire actually begins with Alexander the Great and his conquests in the Trans-Indus region of modern-day Pakistan. Alexander and his armies then crossed the Hindu Kush mountains and advanced into the Punjab. Alexander conquered the important cities of Taxila and Parava, starting his ultimate goal to conquer the whole of India. He also set up Macedonian-style garrisons and Persian-style satrapies, or vassal states, in the Trans-Indus region of modern-day Pakistan as well as the Kashmir region. Following Alexander's advance into the Punjab, a Brahmin named Chanakya traveled to the capital of the Nanda Empire to offer his services as he was a renowned military strategist. The Nanda Empire was a large and militarily powerful empire in the north of India that had been feared by its neighbors, but its king Dahana dismissed him, which humiliated Shanakya, resulting in him vowing to destroy the Nanda Empire. Hearing of Alexander the Great's army's approach, Shanakya thought perhaps King Dahana would receive his comeuppance. However, the prospect of battling the Nanda, who were alleged to have an army of 250,000 men strong, composed of infantry, chariots, cavalry, and war elephants, deterred Alexander's troops, who had been on campaign for years, thousands of miles away from their native Greece, and had no desire to go any further east. This forced Alexander, who was famously reported to be furious about their refusal to continue, to return to Babylon, and he redeployed most of his troops west of the Indus River. When Alexander returned to Babylon, he died of a fever in 323 BC and his empire fragmented, local kings declaring their independence and his generals fighting over the leftovers, leaving several small satraps in a disunified state in northern India. This is where Chanakya comes back into the fold, this time with his young prodigy and future Marian emperor, Chadragupta Maurya. Mystery and controversy shrouds Chadragupta Maurya's rise to power. On one hand, a number of ancient Indian accounts describe his royal ancestry and even link him with the Nanda dynasty. However, some early Buddhist texts also refer to a tribe in the north of India known as the Maraya as his source of origin. However, it is most likely that Chandragupta was a young peasant who caught Chanakya's eye as he was shown to be a strong and brave leader and was taken as Chanakya's student. Any definitive conclusions on Chandragupta's origins require further historical evidence. Chandragupta first emerges in Greek accounts as Sandrokotos. As a young man, he may have met Alexander, and some accounts say that he also may have met Dahana, the Nanda Empire, and angered him before he made a narrow escape. At this time, Chanakya and Chandragupta are said to have spent time training a guerrilla army under Chandragupta's command and had established an area of control somewhere in northern India along the borders of the Nanda Empire. Chanakya encouraged Chandragupta and his guerrilla army to take over the throne of the Nanda Empire, as they both allegedly had scores to settle with Dahana. Using his intelligence network, Chandragupta gathered many young men from across the Nanda Empire and other nearby kingdoms and provinces. Men upset over the corruption and the oppressive rule of King Dahana, 
plus resources necessary for his army to fight a long series of protracted battles with the Great Empire. These men included the former general of Taxila, along with other accomplished students of Chinakya, the representative of King Porus of Kakayi, and his son Malaketu, and the rulers of other small states. Initially, the men are reported to have attacked Dahana at his capital of the empire, located at Paliputra. However, they were unsuccessful, but escaped to fight another day. It is then said that Chanakya and Chandragupta took a different approach, taking border territory from the Nanda Empire and the smallest states in northern India that were destabilized by Alexander's conquests, amassing their strength to ensure they would not fail on their next attempt to conquer the Nanda Empire. Preparing to invade Paliputra for a second time, Chandragupta hatched a plan. He had a battle announced and the Nandan army mustered from the city to a distant battlefield to engage his forces. Chandragupta's generals and spies, meanwhile, bribed the corrupt generals of Nanda. He also managed to create an atmosphere of civil war in the kingdom, which culminated in the death of the heir to the Nanda Empire's throne. Janakya also managed to win over popular sentiments of the people. Ultimately, Dahana, with his heir dead and army defeated, resigned, handing power to Chandragupta, and he went into exile, disappearing from history. Chanakya also contacted the Prime Minister of the Nanda Empire, Rakshasha, and made him understand that he owed loyalty to the Empire and to its people rather than to the Nanda Dynasty, insisting that he continue in office. Chanakya reiterated that choosing to resist would start a war that would severely affect Nanda and destroy the city of Paliputra. Rakshasa accepted Chanakya's reasoning and Chadragupta Maraya was legitimately installed as the new emperor of the new Marayan Empire. Rakshasa became Chadragupta's chief advisor and Chanakya assumed the position of elder statesman. Having become the emperor of a state that controlled most of northern India, Chadragupta looked west and invaded the Punjab, which held one of Alexander's former richest satraps, Pythion, and the satrap of Media, that tried to raise a coalition against him, both of which had broken off on their own after Alexander's death. Chandragupta managed to conquer the Punjab capital of Taxila, an important center of trade and Hellenistic culture, increasing his power and consolidating his control in the region. Chandragupta then headed even further west and again fought with the Greeks when Seleucus, the ruler of the new Seleucid Empire, tried to reconquer the northwestern parts of India during a campaign in 305 BC, but failed. After fierce fighting, the two rulers finally concluded with a peace treaty. A marital treaty implying either a marital alliance between the two dynastic lines or a recognition of marriage between Indians and Greeks, and where Chadragupta received a Greek princess from Seleucus himself. Chandragupta received the satrapies of Cambodia, Gandhara, Kandahara, and Balchostan, making his territory stretch further west than any native empire had ever gone before. Seleucus received 500 war elephants that would play a decisive role in his victory against the Western Hellenistic kings at the Battle of Iphis in 301 BC. Diplomatic relations were established between the Greeks and Indians, with several historians and poets finding residence in Chandragupta's court. Chandragupta established a strong centralized state with a complex system of administration at Paliputra, which according to Greek historians was surrounded by a wooden wall pierced with 64 gates and 570 towers, and rivaled the splendors of Persian sites such as Susa. He also had a Greek ambassador at his court that described a disciplined multitude of servants under Chandragupta who lived simply, honestly, and did not know writing. Emperor Chandragupta Maraya also became the first major Indian monarch to initiate a religious transformation at the highest level when he embraced Jainism, a religious movement resented by the Orthodox Hindu priest who usually attended the imperial court. At an older age, Chandragupta renounced his throne and material possessions to join a wandering group of Jain monks. Chandragupta became a disciple of Aktrarya Badarajyu in his last days. He observed the rigorous but self-purifying Jain ritual of Santhara, where you fast until death. Chandragupta died after reigning for 24 years. His son Bindusara, also known as Amitrokrates, meaning destroyer of foes in Greek, succeeded him in 298 BC at just 22 years old. 
Bindusara was now the second emperor of the Marayan Empire, and was now inheriting an empire that had consisted of what is now northern, central, and eastern parts of India, along with parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Bindusara continued to extend his empire's borders, this time to the southern part of India, conquering all of the Deccan Plateau. Chanakya continued to serve as prime minister during his reign. According to medieval Tibetan scholar Tanarthra, who visited India, Chanakya, before his death, helped Bindusara to destroy the nobles and kings of the 16 kingdoms, and thus become the absolute master of the territory between the eastern and western oceans. Bindusara had brought all 16 states to heel and under the Marayan Empire's banner, and thus conquered almost all of the Indian peninsula. Bindusara did not conquer the friendly Tamil kingdoms of the Cholas, however, as they were effectively tributary states of the Marayas at this point, and their conquest likely would have been too costly for the massive empire to afford, as the Golden Men would be needed to secure the massive border regions of the north. Apart from the southern Tamil states, Kalinga was the only other kingdom in India that did not form a part of Bindusara's empire. It was later conquered by his son Ashoka, who served as the viceroy of Ujjain during his father's reign, which highlights the importance of that trade city. During his rule, the citizens of Taxila revolted twice. The reason for the first revolt was the maladministration of his eldest son Susima. The reason for the second revolt is unknown, but Bindusara could not suppress it in his lifetime. It would be crushed by his son Ashoka after his death. Bindusara maintained friendly diplomatic relations with the Hellenic world, with an ambassador of the Seleucid Emperor living permanently in his court, and the Egyptian king Philadelphus sending envoys to his court regularly. Bindusara died in the 2070s BC and reigned for about 28 to 30 years. Scholars believe that he died around 273 to 272 BC, and that his death was followed by a four-year struggle of succession between his many sons, after which Ashoka became the emperor in 269 to 268 BC. Many contemporary historians consider Chandragupta's grandson and Bindusara's son, Ashoka, was perhaps the greatest of all Indian monarchs, and perhaps the world. H.D. Wells calls him the greatest of kings. As a young prince, Ashoka served as a brilliant commander and administrator who crushed revolts and kept order in Ujjain and Taxila, some of the empire's most important provinces. This shows the trust his father Bindusara had in him. It was also in Taxila, an important trade city on the Silk Road, that Ashoka is said to have been exposed to a vast variety of people and ideas of the world, and that would make him wise beyond his years as a young man. After spending time in crushing a revolt in Taxila, he was then sent to Ujjain, where he would meet and fall in love with his wife, Devi, who was very notable as she was a member of the same clan as the Buddha and was likely a practicing Buddhist herself, something that would have a huge impact on Ashoka later on in his life. It is said while in Ujjain that he heard of his father's failing health and rushed to the capital of the empire at Paliputra. A long civil war then broke out between him and his brothers, ultimately ending with Ashoka prevailing over all of his brothers and becoming the new Mauryan emperor. As an ambitious and aggressive ruler, he reasserted the empire's superiority in the southern and western parts of India. But it was the conquest of the small state of Kalinga, the only state that his father Bindusara had not conquered, that proved to be the most pivotal event of his life. Although Ashoka's army succeeded in overwhelming the Kalinga forces of royal soldiers and civilian units, an estimated 100,000 soldiers and civilians died in the furious warfare, including 10,000 of Ashoka's own men. Hundreds of thousands of people became refugees. When he personally witnessed the devastation, Ashoka began feeling remorse and cried, What have I done? Although the annexation of Kalinga was complete, Ashoka embraced the teachings of the Buddha and renounced war and violence, stating that even one hundredth or one thousandth part of those who were slain or even captured in Kalinga is considerably regrettable by the beloved of the gods. For a monarch in ancient times, this was a historic and unprecedented event. After Ashoka's renunciation of war to acquire territory, he established friendly relations with the three Tamil dynasties at the southern tip of India, as his father Bindusara had done before him. This was the only territory in India that was not directly under the control of the Marayan dynasty. Ashoka implemented policies that banned hunting and violent sport 
activity and ended indentured and forced labor. Many thousands of people in the war ravaged Kalinga had been forced into hard labor and slavery. And while he maintained a large and powerful army to keep the peace and maintain authority, Ashoka expanded friendly relations with states across Asia and Europe, and he sponsored Buddhist missions and undertook massive public works in building campaigns across the Mauryan Empire. The edicts of Ashoka were set in stone and have been found throughout the subcontinent, ranging from as far west as Afghanistan and as far south as Andraha. Ashoka's edicts state his policies and accomplishments for all those to read. Although these edicts were written for the most part in Prakrit, two of them have been written in Greek and one both in Greek and Aramaic. Ashoka's edicts refer to the Greeks, Cambojas, and Ganaharas as people forming a frontier region of his empire. They also attest to Ashoka having sent envoys to the Greek rulers in the west as far as the Mediterranean. The edicts precisely name each of the rulers of the Hellenistic world at the time. When Ashoka embraced Buddhism following the Kalinga War, he sent a mission led by his son and daughter to Sri Lanka, whose king adopted the Buddhist ideals, making Buddhism the state religion of the country even to this day. Ashoka sent many Buddhist missions to West Asia, Greece, Southeast Asia, and commissioned the construction of monasteries, schools, and publication of Buddhist literature across the Mauryan Empire. It is estimated that Ashoka may have built as many as 84,000 stupas across India and increased the popularity of Buddhism in Afghanistan. Ashoka also helped convene the Third Buddhist Council of India and South Asia's Buddhist Orders, near his capital, a council that undertook much work of reform and expansion of the Buddhist religion. While himself a Buddhist, Ashoka retained the membership of Hindu priests and ministers in his court and maintained religious freedom and tolerance throughout the empire, although the Buddhist faith grew in popularity with his patronage. Indian society also began embracing the philosophy of Ahamiza, and given the increased prosperity and improved law enforcement, crime and internal conflicts reduced dramatically throughout the empire. Due to Buddhism and Jainism's inherent anti-caste teaching and philosophy, the caste system and traditional practices of discrimination among the social groups fell into disfavor, as Hinduism began absorbing the ideas and values of the Jain and Buddhist teachings. Social freedom began expanding in an age of peace and prosperity across the empire. Ashoka also had the empire divided into four provinces with the imperial capital at Patlaputra, from Ashokan edicts, the names of the four provincial capitals are as follows. Tusali in the east, Ujjain in the west, Sumavargriji in the south, and Taxila in the north. The head of the provincial administration had been the Kumara, the royal prince, who governed the provinces as the king's representative, with a council of ministers assisting the Kumara. This organizational structure mirrored the imperial level with the emperor and his council of ministers. An intricate municipal system formed by the Mariah Empire to govern its cities was also established. A city council made up of 30 commissioners was divided into six committees or boards which helped govern each city. The first board fixed wages and looked after provided goods. The second board made arrangements for foreign dignitaries, tourists, and businessmen. The third board made records and registrations. The fourth looked after manufactured goods and sales of commodities. The fifth board regulated trade and issued licenses and checked weights and measurements. And the sixth boards collected sales taxes. Some of the larger cities in the empire, such as Talixa, had the autonomy to issue their own coins. The city council had officers who looked after public welfare, such as maintenance, roads, public buildings, markets, hospitals, and educational institutions. The city council also may have had some magisterial powers as well. Historians theorize that the organization of the empire was in line with the extensive bureaucracy of the cities. A sophisticated civil service governed everything from municipal hygiene to international trade. The expansion and defense of the empire made possible by what appears to be the largest standing army of its time. According to Seleucid Greek accounts, the empire wielded a military of 600,000 infantry, 30,000 cavalry, and 9,000 war elephants all paid for by the vast tax collection throughout the empire. A vast espionage system also collected intelligence for both internal and external security purposes. With Ashoka's rule for the first time in South Asia, political unity and military security allowed for a common economic system and enhanced trade and commerce with increased agricultural productivity. 
The previous situation involving hundreds of kingdoms, many small armies, powerful regional chieftains, and high amounts of warfare gave way to a disciplined central authority. Farmers were freed of tax and crop collection burdens from regional kings, instead paying to a nationally administered and strict but fair system of taxation. Chagragupta Maraya also established a single currency across India and a network of regional governors and administrators, and a civil service provided justice and security for merchant, farmers, and traders. The Marayan army also wiped out many gangs of bandits, regional private armies, and powerful chieftains who sought to impose their own supremacy in small areas across the empire. Although regimental and strict in their tax collection, the Marayans also sponsored many public works and waterways to enhance productivity, while internal trade in India expanded greatly due to the newfound political unity and internal peace. Under the Indo-Greek Friendship Treaty and during Ashoka's reign, an international network of trade expanded. The Khyber Pass on the modern boundary of Pakistan and Afghanistan became a strategically important port of trade and connection with the outside world. The Greek and Hellenic kingdoms in West Asia also became important trade partners of the Marian Empire and trade extended throughout the Malayan Peninsula as well in Southeast Asia. Indians' exports included silk, textiles, spices, and exotic foods. An exchange of scientific knowledge and technology with Europe and West Asia also enriched the empire further. Ashoka also sponsored the construction of thousands of roads, waterways, canals, hospitals, rest houses, and many other public works along the major roads, making traveling throughout the Marian Empire pleasant. Ashoka's easing of many overly rigorous administrative practices, including those regarding taxation and crop collection, helped increase productivity and economic activity and prosperity across the Marian Empire. Ashoka, after 41 long prosperous years of rule, died in 232 BC and was followed by 50 years of a succession of weak kings. The accounts of what actually happened in this period are not universally agreed upon, as Buddhist, Hindu, and Jain texts all give conflicting accounts. It seems that Ashoka's son and primary heir was born blind or was blinded sometime in his life, thus making him unable to rule. This made Ashoka's grandson, Dasharatha, the next emperor of the Marian Empire. Dasharatha was not known as a great leader, and thus many of the provinces, sensing weakness on the outskirts of the empire, broke away with little resistance from the Marian Empire's heartland. It is likely that Dasharatha was assassinated or deposed by his relative Samprati. The cycle of territory loss, internal strife, and betrayal would continue with the following emperors of Shalishuka and Sadratanran gaining power by deposing the previous emperor as well, and this would result in a death spiral for the Marian Empire. The final blow would come during the reign of Brihadrata, the last ruler of the Marian dynasty, with his held territories being shrunk considerably from the time of Emperor Ashoka, although he still upheld the Buddhist faith. Brihadrata was assassinated in 185 BC during a military parade by his commander-in-chief of his guard, the Brahmin general Pisamitra Sangha who then took over the throne and established the Sangha dynasty, officially putting an end to the Marian Empire and the dynasty. Buddhist records reveal that the assassination of Bihadrata and the rise of the Sangha Empire led to a wave of persecution for Buddhists and a resurgence of Hinduism. Pusamitra may have been the main instigator of these persecutions, although later Sangha kings seem to have been more supportive of Buddhism. In our modern day, few architectural remains of the Marian period have been found. Remains of a hypostyle building with about 80 columns of a height of about 10 meters have been found in Kamharar, 5 kilometers from Patnaan Railway Station, one of the few Marian sites located. The style resembles the Persian Achaemenid architecture, likely due to the influence from the Greeks that the Marians constantly traded and interacted with. The grottos of the Barabar Caves provide another example of Marian architecture, especially the decorated front of the Loma Shirishi Grotto. The pillars of Ashoka, often exquisitely decorated, constitute outstanding examples of Marian architecture, with more than 40 spread throughout the Indian subcontinent, and while little remains physically of the Marian Empire, the cultural impact of the Marians is undeniable. During the time of the Marian rule in India, it was an era of social harmony, religious transformation, and expansion of learning and science. Chadragupta Maraya's embrace of Jainism increased social and religious renewal and reform across his society. Ashoka's embrace of Buddhism was the foundation of social and political peace and nonviolence across all of India for almost a half century. 
The era fostered a spread of Buddhist ideals into Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, West Asia, and the Mediterranean. Chanakya, Chadragupta's mentor and main advisor, also wrote the Arthashastra during this time, which is considered one of the greatest treaties on economics, politics, foreign affairs, administration, military arts, war, and religion ever produced, on par with Sun Tzu's Art of War and Machiavelli's Power. Ashoka is also considered the greatest of Indian monarchs and possibly the world, and a major figure in the Buddhist religion even to this day. Even the lion capital of Ashoka at Sarnath remains the emblem of India today, showing that even though the empire fell 2,000 years ago, it is still remembered and honored by the people of India to this very day. Thank you for watching this documentary on the history of the Mariah Empire. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and check out my other videos, and subscribe for more history, documentaries, and related content.